12, and then we went transitioned over to a Pentecostal Assembly of God church. But just because we were attending the Baptist church didn't mean I wasn't familiar with the Pentecostal church because my mom grew up in a very big Pentecostal church. And so there were times that I remember us visiting to see my grandparents at that Pentecostal church. And, uh, and then my dad finally had a realization that Pentecost is the way to go. And so we transitioned. But I remember being a young lad, watching the Holy Spirit work, watching people cry out in the Holy Spirit, watching people lift their hands in the Holy Spirit, going to Pentecostal church, watching people cry, watching people shout, watching people get all excited because the Holy Spirit was real in their life. I came across this in my preparation. There was supposedly a pastor down in Houston who preached against Santa Claus. And a prophecy followed. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, lay off Santa Claus. He's a good man and he's doing a good work. Now, I don't think that's a good representation of what prophecy is about. Somebody got a little bit out of control about that. And the problem that we have sometimes with Pentecost and the Holy Spirit is that it does get a little bit emotional. And I'm hoping that sometime through this series that you will begin to know and to understand the differences of who God the Father is, who Jesus Christ is, and who the Holy Spirit is, and specifically the role of the Holy Spirit. Some refer it to as the Holy Ghost. And I remember being a teenager and a kid seeing about, hearing about the Holy Ghost and immediately Immediately, as a kid and as a young person, my mind would go, are there spirits just flying around the building, you know? I'd be like looking for them, wondering where are they at, you know? Like the Casper just, woo, you know? Wondering, what is this Holy Spirit thing? Well, we're going to begin looking at this today. And I'm hoping that you will experience a freshness in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a person. He is not a force like Star Wars. You know, and may the force be with you. It's not like that. It's not a force. It is powerful. But He is a real person. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit is active. Today, He is active. You know, I remember being on a missions trip one time. We went to Kosovo, and then our travels back to Kos- from Kosovo, when we stopped in Vienna, and Cindy and I and the group that went from our church, there were about eight of us, I believe, we actually decided, you know, while we're in Vienna, Austria, we ought to take a couple days and just enjoy Vienna, Austria, you know. And so there are churches all over that city, old, old churches. Some of them, I think there was one, it was built in 1812, a cathedral that was absolutely gorgeous. So you'd all know that the uh, Notre Dame just burnt, right? Okay, I mean, imagine that kind of construction in, in Vienna. And I remember walking in there and seeing absolutely gorgeous things. How many of you know that some of those old cathedrals would actually have murals or frescoes painted on the ceilings? Well, I heard a story about a man who went and visited where Michelangelo's painting was on the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, and he had noted that the painting was of the Last Judgment, and he had noticed that while he was there, that the painting looked a little dull, and the painting looked a little bit gray, and he began to inquire as to why that painting was so dull and so gray. And he came to realize that Because of all the candles that were being burnt, they emitted some smoke, and that smoke, the dark smoke, right, eventually floated to the ceiling, and what it did is it created a film over that artwork. And it took some time for them to come back and to clean that artwork and to layer that off. If you've ever been in a smoker's house, right, and you've seen all the yellow on the wall, I think that's a good depiction of understanding what it would have been like to see that. Well, this series on the Holy Spirit, I hope, will begin to help us to understand that we can peel away some of the layers of film that might have been developed in our life or that might cloud the vision of what the Holy Spirit is. So let's try to fully understand the Holy Spirit. Will you experience Him? Will you open yourselves up to what He might have? Can I encourage you not to be scared or to be threatened? Because I remember being there. I remember wondering, whoa, this is weird. I remember saying that to myself. I remember saying, I'm never raising my hands. I'm never dancing. I'm never shouting. I'm never... I remember thinking, this is cuckoo. And I'm here to tell you today, there is something real about the Holy Spirit in the experience that we need to have with Him. 
And I don't think sometimes he gets the appropriate due that is to his name. You know, we get God the Father. We understand God the Father. Whether we have had a good father or we haven't had a good father, we've all probably at some point experienced what a father is and we know what a father should be and look like. We get Jesus Christ who is a son. We're daughters and sons of moms and dads. And so we kind of understand that. But sometimes we have a difficult time understanding what this Holy Spirit is. How do we comprehend it? And that's okay, I understand that. And the early Christians, they even struggled with that. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, and you'll see through this series, we're going to use a lot of different translations and versions of the Bible. This one's coming to the New Living Translation. It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior region until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. And they said this, Do you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they asked, and he asked them, and he said, no, we replied, we didn't even... No, or have ever heard that there was a Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may be best understood this way. And this is it. Here's how you understand what the Holy Spirit is. You have an experience with the Holy Spirit. He must be experienced. It's never sufficient to simply describe the Holy Spirit. You have to have an experience in order for you to express who the Holy Spirit is. And that is important to understand. Right? You can read about it, you can read the Bible, but until you experience the Holy Spirit and His power, you're never going to understand all that you can understand about Him. And I want to encourage you to experience Him. You know, I've, I've heard that grandkids are great. How many grandparents would say grandkids are great? I hope to find that out soon. But I've heard they're great, but I've also heard this, that until you have them, you don't understand them. You don't understand how great it is. I, I just recently heard this, something along the lines of this, that grandkids are a reward for not killing your kids. I didn't kill mine, so I'm waiting to experience the joy. So spirit will never be fully known by simply reading about him and debating him. You must come to have an experience with him. And so hopefully over... Today, in the month of June, as we go through this series, we will begin to know and understand a little bit better about who the Holy Spirit is. And it is my desire that each of us as individuals will have a new and a fresh encounter with God and His Holy Spirit. But as we were worshiping this morning, I was quickly reminded... That choice is up to you. I cannot force it. I cannot dictate it. I cannot bring it about. The only way that you ever will experience the Holy Spirit is by you opening yourselves up and say, Father, here I am and I come to you. Now, we can sing songs. We can pray. We can do all of that stuff to try to encourage you to enter the Holy Spirit's presence and enter in God's presence. But that choice is totally up to you because I have been in services where I have experienced the power of God and the person that was before me, beside me, behind me, in front of me did not. Because they chose not to. Romans chapter 8, 1 through 9. I want This is a crux of our scripture this morning. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the living, giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Did you see that? The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did not, excuse me, so that God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer followed our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. 
But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. There is a clear distinction here in Romans chapter 8 of those who are following Christ and those who are not. And one leads to life and one leads to death. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us as we embark upon this new journey of understanding your Holy Spirit and the role that it plays in our life and who He is, that God, I pray that we would come with an open mind and with an open heart and with a readiness to hear from You. Let us not allow our preconceived ideas. Let us not allow the things that the enemy says to us in our heart and in our mind and in our spirit to distract us from what You would have for us. And I pray that you would help me, God, to deliver this message to the best of my ability, to the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, I will say this. Let me encourage you to take notes. This is going to take five weeks for us to get through. And there is a ton of information that I am going to be laying out for you. And I just want you to make sure that you grasp grasp it as much as you can. And may I ask you to do this you please be in prayer as we go through this series for yourself for this body and for me as your pastor because i truly believe here in the last week in the last couple of days that i personally have believed that the enemy has been attacking me and trying to distract my mind and to get me distracted on what we need to be focusing on So I want to go through three things today, and I want you to keep your heart open in mind. Number one is this. The Holy Spirit brings freedom. Say freedom. Freedom. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 4 again. I want you to see this, and I want to read it to you again. So now there is no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, again, He's writing to believers, the power of the living or life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. He's writing to those that have been freed. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His only Son in the body, in, the, uh, in, in a body like the bodies that we sinners have, in that the body God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sin. Look to John chapter 3, verse 16 if you want more reference for that. Verse 4. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. See what Paul is writing here? He is saying, stop following the flesh and start living in the Spirit. There is no condemnation. It is incredibly freeing to know that you have not been condemned by your sin anymore, but that you have been set free to live in Christ. Man, that is a powerful statement. I mean, we should, as believers, we should be like, Woohoo! I am free! I mean, there are a lot of people in this world that are carrying a weight and a burden in their life, and they are wondering, how do I live? How do I go on? How can I take another step? And he is saying that if you live in the Spirit, you're free from sin. Let me give you some things that freedom does for us. Freedom starts with forgiveness. The Spirit draws us to Christ. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. But you must choose to accept His forgiveness and then live as forgiven people. You have to choose this acceptance. It, it, it's, it, what is the word He gives? He gives us the word right. He, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Right? Basically, what is He doing? He's given a gift. The only way you get that gift is you receive that gift. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. What is he saying to them? They should be reading this. 
Check your mind. Check your heart. What controls your thoughts? If your thoughts are being controlled by the flesh, you've you got to get something right back in the Spirit. Paul completely understood this. In Romans chapter 7, he shared about his struggles with sin in living in life and following. Remember, he says, I don't do the things that I ought to do, and I do the things I not ought to do. He understands what he was trying to get across to them. But we have to remember that freedom comes when we ask for forgiveness, and we learn to live in that forgiveness. And that's given by the Holy Spirit. Sin doesn't have to have power over you. How many of you hate it when you sin? I do too. I hate it. But usually when that happens, it's because we have allowed ourselves to get off of what the Spirit wants to do in our life. And we've chosen physically. I mean, I've been in those spiritual battles, right? Like, oh, I know I shouldn't do this, but... And we say things like this. Oh, God will forgive me. (laughs) I understand that. But we don't have to live that way. We can understand that there's greater power in Him. Because what does the Word say? Greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. So we need to learn to forgive ourselves because of the forgiveness that was offered to us through Jesus Christ. Number B on this is this, is that freedom is sustained. Freedom is sustained by the Spirit. It's one thing to know that you have been set free. It's another thing to live and to walk in it and to understand it. That, that's a part of the, that, that can be part of the problem. See, some people will come to church and they'll say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And they seek only a Savior. They don't seek a Lord. And they stop right there at that moment. They know they've been forgiven, but they don't understand how to live in that forgiveness because they have stopped seeking the Spirit to say, what do I need in my life to walk this life that you have called me to live? And so then they battle back and forth, back and forth between I'm living in the Spirit and I'm living in the flesh. I'm living in the Spirit and I'm living in the flesh. And the enemy attacks us because we have stopped seeking the Spirit. So here's how he attacks us. None of this is revelation to you. He tries to undermine God's credibility. He tries to make it hard for you to live as a Christian in the Christian life. He tries to confuse you with false teachings. Look in Colossians. We just went through the book of Colossians. You'll see that. He tries to cause division in the body of Christ. He tries to get you to trust yourself more than God. That's how the enemy attacks us. That's how he, that's all he can do. He does everything that he can to keep us away from the Spirit because he understands that if we are living and walking in the Spirit, then we are going to be walking in power that is greater than the power that he exhibits. So he does everything to discourage us to stay away from the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Pray in the Spirit. I'm going to say it again. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. We should be praying for ourselves. We should be praying for one another that the Spirit of God would do what He needs to do. But if we aren't filled with the Spirit, we can't pray in the Spirit. If we aren't seeking the Spirit, we can't let the Holy Spirit lead us in our life and know how to pray for one another. One of the reasons we need to pray in the Spirit is because He cannot defeat Satan, but we can't defeat Him in our own strength. How many of you have found that out? You need the Spirit of God in your life. And He loves to keep us from living in that freedom the enemy does. He loves to keep you in bondage. He loves to keep you in isolation. I see we've got several missing today. I'm hoping it's because it's a holiday weekend. Okay, But as a pastor, I always wonder, where's so-and-so? What are they doing? Have they been seeking God today? Maybe they're not here today because they've been battling. And the enemy has gotten a hold of them. And they decided, well, I'm just going to stay home today. One week's not going to make a difference. Two will. Three will. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty because you got work situations or like I know Bib might not be here today because of surgery. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about what is in the intent of our hearts. It is to live and by the power of the Spirit of God, or is it to just walk through this life and hope I slide into heaven? The third thing I want you to see here in this and freedom is is freedom is strengthened by your daily experiences with the Spirit. Your daily experiences with the Spirit. Think about this your daily experience in the Spirit gives you an understanding of God's mysteries. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says, there, These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. You, you want to know what God's will is for your life? Get in the Spirit and walk and talk with Him. Because that's where He speaks to us. Your daily experience in the Spirit gives you enlightenment to Scripture. You don't understand what the Word of God is saying? Spend some time in prayer. Ask the Spirit to lead you. Look at John 16, verse 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He gives us His Spirit so that we can understand who He is. Your daily experience in the Spirit gives you the opportunity to connect with the community of faith. How many of you love Bethel Temple? How many of you love the fact that you don't have to live this life on your own? Yes. I love that. I mean, there are strength in numbers. There's encouragement that comes when we gather together. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. It says this in the King James Version. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking the bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their church daily such as being saved. So as they gathered together, they encouraged one another. They prayed with one another. They prayed in the Holy Spirit. They were led by God because they were seeking Him. And He told them what to do. And as a result of their obedience to them, what happened? The church exploded. Why? Because they said, the Spirit of God is evident and real in my life. If we are walking in the Spirit, we are walking in the power of God, then guess what? We're just attending a building. And having church frees us to know that we don't have to do this alone. Point number two this morning is the Holy Spirit brings peace. The Holy Spirit brings peace. This is good news because everyone is looking for peace. Everybody wants peace. Nobody wants turmoil. And in this world, we hear about it on a regular basis. If not... Daily, certainly weekly, we hear about some kind of attack, some kind of a terrorist type situation, some kind of an outpouring of something weird and wild and wacky to the point now where we probably just like, oh, I've heard that already. Right? We've really kind of become almost numb to that. Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. We read it earlier, but I want us to see this. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That though, that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. You want peace in your life? You want a peace that is deeper than any understanding? You want joy so that when you face situations and circumstances that you wonder, how am I going to make it? Find the Holy Spirit. I I love it when I hear a believer say, I have no idea what these people live. I I I couldn't do what they're doing because they don't have God in their life. I I love it when I hear that because what that means is that they understand that in the midst of that situation, if I was in that, it would not be fun. It would not be something I'd be like, "Yeah, go through this, woo!" But in the midst of that situation, I can have peace knowing that God is in control. That it's not about me, that it's all about Him. That I have been bought with a price and His child. And He knows exactly what He's doing. And everybody is looking for peace of mind in these days. People will do anything and they will spend anything and they will almost go anywhere to find it. I can tell you, well, we were actually in Orange Beach, not Gulf Shores, Alabama, all right? I mean, it's just right down the road. But I'm just telling you, there was a lot of peace sitting on that beach. Lot. Just listening to the waves rolling in. 
I paid for it. But it was really nice to be able to sit there in that peaceful environment and to know that God created these ways. God created this place that I'm sitting and resting in. Got to know that, you know what, He's there with me and I can feel His presence. And that was a deeper peace than I know that many that I came across were experiencing. Because I found a girl laying on the beach who the night before got drunk and was wasted and I don't know how long she laid on that beach. See, there was a difference of me laying on that beach and her laying on that beach. She had tried to find that peace by going to the town, to a festival, to drink all that she could drink, to the point where I have no idea how long she passed out on that beach. And then to wonder, where's my phone? Where's my purse? Where's my credit cards? Where are my friends? She made a statement to me as I walked her back to her condo where she said she was staying. Well, some kind of friends I have that they left me out here. See, when we don't have Jesus and we don't have the Holy Spirit living in our life, we've missed out on something. There are several things in this life that tend to steal our peace of mind. Let me give you some of those thieves. Uncontrollable circumstances. When circumstances become uncontrollable, we often lose our peace. Think about those times that you've gotten frustrated, right? I mean, things that you can't control, right? Like you're stuck in traffic on I-64 coming home from Charlotte, or Charleston. <laughs> or you're in an airport and you find out that your flight has been delayed and now you've got to spend the whole day in the airport or find a place to pay a hotel room. Or your co-workers are having bad attitudes and you can't control the situation. Here's some other things that might change your peace. Unchangeable people. Isn't it interesting how resistant some people are to change? I was flipping through Facebook the other day and as I was reviewing my notes today, because I've written this several weeks ago, a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine had posted this from Wildrow Wilson. I thought it was applicable here. He says, if you want to make enemies, try changing something. You ever tried to change somebody? It usually doesn't work too well. Unanticipated problems are an issue with us sometimes. This happens regularly. It's a part of life. Here's some important questions that we need to ask us. And how does the Holy Spirit bring peace? The Holy Spirit helps us to accept what we can't control. John chapter 14, verse 26 and 27. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give it, but let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He will give you peace. I came across this, and it was written by D.L. Moody. It says, did you ever think that when Christ was dying on the cross that He made a will? Perhaps you have thought that um, you have never been remembered in a will. And if you are in the kingdom of Christ, remember that you are in His will. He willed His body to Joseph of Arimathea. He willed His mother to, excuse me, yeah, His mother to John, the son of Zebedee. And He willed His spirit back to His Father. But to His disciples, this is what He said, My peace, I leave that you, I leave with you that it is my legacy, my joy, and I give that to you. He says, My joy, I give to you. He willed His joy in His peace to His children. They say that a man cannot make a will that a lawyer cannot maybe find a way through. But He says this, He goes on, He says, And I challenge them to break Christ's will, to let them try it. No judge or jury can set that aside. Christ rose to execute His own will. And if He had left us a lot of gold, the thieves might have come and have stolen it in the first century. But He said that He left His peace and His joy to every true believer, and no power on earth can take away your joy. Amen. When we seek the Holy Spirit, even when the world's troubled and your heart is troubled, God can bring peace to you through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps you to trust God 
in His loving care. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, in that you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. Do you see that? He will keep you in perfect peace if you trust in Him, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Remember, if we are living in the flesh, we will reap death. If we are living in the Spirit, we will reap life. We live in a fallen world, and there is a foe that is out there. And we have faults. All of these truths are out there for us. And the enemy wants to destroy our life. He wants to rip the peace out of your life. But God's Spirit will sustain you if you will trust in Him. Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love your instruction have great peace and do not stumble. What's the key? You have to love Him. You have to love His instruction. When we live in obedience to God, rather than struggling against Him, we have peace in our hearts and we live in His protection. The third point I have for you today is this, is that the Holy Spirit brings fellowship. The Holy Spirit brings fellowship. Consider the Trinity. God makes Himself known in the three persons. We've talked about that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each person has its own way of communicating and and interacting with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14 says this. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What does the fellowship of the Spirit mean? It means that the Holy Spirit really wants a friendship with you. Say friendship. He wants a friendship with you. He wants a relationship with you. That's why He sent His Son. He is a catalyst for helping us understand that God is not some distant deity, somebody out there, some figment of an imagination, or some kind of alien that's sitting out there in some other world somewhere where you're wondering if this is real or is this not real. He is real. And He came... So that we might have a relationship. That's the whole purpose of why Jesus came to this earth. He came to be a catalyst to die for our sin so that we can be reconciled back to God so that we can have a continuous relationship and fellowship with Him. A relationship that is everlasting to everlasting. God has always been at work to be involved in relationship with us. At creation, from the very beginning, what did He say? He says that He breathed life into Adam. What would it have been like if God would have created a human and just left him there for dead? There was no relationship there. But He said, no, I want a relationship. So He breathed life into humanity. At the cross, Jesus died so that we could be forgiven and in a right relationship with Him. He's now preparing, and for us all believers, what does the Scripture say? That He says that that if I go, I go what? To prepare a place for you. So in other words, why is He doing that? Because He wants you to come and be reunited with Him and to have a relationship with Him that goes on and on and on and on. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit involves sharing our lives in communion with Him. It's opening the deepest parts of our personality, our thoughts, our motives, our feelings, our attitudes, our decisions, our futures, our fear, our passions, to influence and to direct and have the direction of the Holy Spirit in our life. Remember what I said that the only way you will understand the Holy Spirit is to have an experience with Him. If you shut off your emotions, if you shut off your motives, if you shut off your feelings and your thoughts and your attitudes, you can't have a relationship with Him. Because you'll say, oh, I don't know about that. And he says, please. Please, please, please. Let me in. Let me in. This fellowship helps us to avoid the sin against the Spirit. Things like envy, jealousy, selfishness, ambition, sexual immorality, and develop the character traits that God has called us to, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Why do we struggle in this life so much? Sometimes. It's because we don't allow the Spirit to live in us. If we want to have peace, we want to have joy, we want to have satisfaction... We want to develop the fruits of the Spirit. We have to be willing to let the Holy Spirit live in us. They're called the fruits of the Spirit for a reason, not the fruit of man. 
You can't have the fruit of the Spirit without letting the Spirit live in you. That's why we have a lot of frustrated Christians. Because they don't allow the Spirit to live in them. And so then they realize, oh, I'm not living in love. I'm not living in joy. I'm not in self-control. I don't have kindness and I don't have goodness. It's because you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to live in you. If you let the Holy Spirit live in you, He'll live through you. And you'll have peace in your life. But no, instead we listen to the lies of the devil and he just holds us back and he constrains us. I, it, what bothers me so much as a pastor and as a minister is to see people that sit in a place, in a building, whether it's a church or whether it's a conference center, and the Holy Spirit is moving and we're worshiping Him and people are just like... And that hurts me because I'm like, if you would just open up a little bit... If you will just give him a crack to let his light in, it'll change your life. This life in Christ is contingent on our relationship and on the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is the glue to that relationship with Him. You cannot have a sustaining, strong relationship with Almighty God if you do not allow the Holy Spirit to live in your life. You can't. So he is what we need on a daily basis. Let me say that again. He is what we need on a daily basis. I'm going to say it. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night is never enough. I'm going to say it again. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night is never going to be enough for you to be satisfied. It's a daily walk. You have to purposely say, Holy Spirit, I've got to connect with you today. I, find a way. Find a time. Find what works. I don't care. But find a way to connect with Him on a daily basis. Because let me tell you something. The enemy is connecting with you every day. Let me conclude. Life in the Spirit includes so many benefits and blessings. They are all for our benefit. And they are much more than only the few gifts that manifest themselves in the community setting like we were talking about. All right? I haven't even talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I didn't talk about, I'm not talking about that today. I hope you understand that. We'll talk about that in a couple more weeks. I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about connecting, strictly connecting with the Spirit of God in your life. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Jesus said, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, I'm inviting you today to open your heart to the Holy Spirit. To invite Him in to your life by simply asking Him to come and to have fellowship with you. He won't force this on you. You've got to hear that. He will not force Himself on you. He's already revealed who He is. If you know Him, you know He's come and He's left and His Son is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit is... Let me say this. The Holy Spirit is still active in the world today. Alright? But He's not a bully. He's here. He's pleading with us. Let me in. Let me a part of it, be a part of your life. Let me show you how to have peace. Let me show you how to have hope. Let me show you how to live in power to overcome sin. But you have to let Him in. He's knocking on the door, but you've got to open it. And He's saying to you, will you let me in today? Tomorrow's another day. Well, Pastor, it's a holiday tomorrow. Don't I get to just relax and do what I want to do? Well, let me ask you this. Do you think the enemy is going to take tomorrow off? 
I don't think so because he says what in John 10.10? 10, 10, that he, he's a thief and he comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. All he cares about is wrecking your life. It doesn't say that he does it 360 days of the year, right? Like on Christmas and Easter and Good Friday and how their holidays, right? The 4th of July, that he just takes a holiday himself. He never takes time off. And neither does the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's there every time we need Him if we'll call out to Him. So I'm asking you, will you invite Him in today? Will you ask Him to help you experience His freedom? Will you ask Him to help you experience His peace? Will you ask Him to help you experience His fellowship today? If you bow your heads, close your eyes. Larry, if you'll come. Jeff, would you come as well? Because I want to do that last.